evening everyone, my name is John Simpson, I'm a Professor of Paediatric and Fetal Cardiology at the Evelina London Children's Hospital and for the next 20 minutes or so I'm going to be talking through um, fetal cardiac scanning as it pertains to guideline statements. I think this sort of guidelines that we have for scanning can roughly be divided into three sorts of categories. The first are guidelines which are truly for screening and subsequent to that we're looking at some um, triage of groups with an elevated chance of congenital heart disease, which is often done by fetal medicine specialists. And then as a subspecialist le level, it's really the scanning of fetuses with either suspected or confirmed congenital heart disease, where we're looking to refine a diagnosis and either confirm or refute a normality. If we look, first of all, with respect to screening, Probably the best known international guidelines are those from uh, ISUOG. Um, as I, I suspect we're all aware, many guidelines have been rewritten currently, So, but I'm using the guidelines as they're currently published. And then we can move across, and in the UK, for example, we have national guidelines which relate to screening views of, of the whole of the anomaly scan, but including core fetal cardiac views as part of the anomaly scan. I think the common theme which really emerges from the published guidelines is that they're looking at optimal performance at 18 to 22 weeks. Recommendations are really quite consistently based on the series of axial views. So if we look from the situs views in here, inferiorly here through to well recognizable four chamber views, left ventricular outflow tract, right ventricular outflow tract, and then either three vessel or three vessel trachea views. There are some variations as to whether there's three vessel or three vessel trachea view depending on individual guidance. But for all of these screening guidance, color flow Doppler is encouraged, but it's not considered to be mandatory. So if we look at uh, national standards, these are really stating what uh, in an individual jurisdiction, the views that really need to be obtained. Some of the recommendations are quite interesting. So for example, in the UK, all the Heart card key cardiac views are recommended, but storage of those cardiac views is not stipulated. <clears throat> this really does limit our ability to understand why some congenital heart defects might be missed. And I would refer you on to an excellent paper here from the Dutch group in uh, 2020 ultrasounds in Obstinkine, which investigates this further as the reasons why these might be missed, where they do have reference to uh, stored images. So really, as we look through these views, coming to how, what these look like, we're looking at views which really go through from the views inferiorly through to standard four chamber views and the outflow tracts. And this is just illustrated here. We come up from the situs view, we see the pulmonary veins draining, a balanced four chamber view, mitral valve further from the apex, balanced size, good ventricular function, and mitral and tricuspid valves opening nicely. And this should be very familiar. So rather than being fixed views, these are really obtained just sweeps and we see the left ventricular outflow tract, which is common to all recommendations, sweeping more cranially up to the right ventricular outflow tract into, and then subsequently to three vessel trachea view. And this type of sweep would be very typical of the sort of recommendations which we'd be familiar with. When we look at uh, the use of color flow Doppler, this is, uh, slightly different. Again, we see the standard views and I would most suggest recommendations, in fact, all recommendations suggest starting with color, uh, sorry, starting with grayscale and then moving on to add color. And now we see the color views with the pulmonary artery and duct, transverse aortic arch as we come down here towards the left ventricular outflow tract. And then we see nice flow into across both the mitral and tricuspid valves without any sign of any significant regurgitation. So the views and sweeps are really redone with the use of color flow Doppler. So I don't think there's anything particularly controversial in those views, but as I say, most are, are fairly consistent and they're based around axial views. And when you look at consistency, as I say, series of axial views using uh, 2D, Color flow is encouraged, but not a requirement.
But of note, if for the screening recommendations is pulse Doppler, CW and other types of more advanced techniques are not currently uh, part of established guidelines. Now, if we look at now moving on from screening views to what constitutes recommendations for more detailed fetal heart scanning or fetal echocardiography, there are several reference statements, including the ISUOG statement from 2008, the Association for European Pediatric Cardiology Guidelines in 2004, American Society of Echo Guidelines in 2014, and the American Institute for Ultrasound and Medicine uh, uh, recommendations uh, published in 2020. These include a Doppler interrogation. So now we're looking at pulse Doppler of the inflows, so mitral inflow, tricuspid valve inflow added to the standard interrogation. And as we come up towards the outflow tracks, this is in the same sort of suite supplemented by Doppler of the aortic valve here and the subsequently the pulmonary valve. And you note from the sort of images and color flow that we see is that really the color and images we get now are really not comparable to those which, which we were seeing uh, you know, 10 years ago when most of these recommendations were being produced. Of note is when we look at color is we can't rely on one color scale. So if we are going to use color uh, as, as some of the guidelines state, you really have to gain some competence and familiarity in terms of, for example, the color scales to use color optimally here. So the reduced color scales to look at the pulmonary venous drainage. But of, it, of note here is that when you look at the, the recommendations, when we start with the ISUOG guidelines, and yes, it's a series of axial views, but supplemented by other views, color flow Doppler uniformly recommended across uh, all of the recommendations, and really a more selective approach to generally to pulsed and continuous, continuous wave in particular, but stipulated as part of the ASE guidelines and the AIUM guidelines of 2020. So rather more in the recent guidelines than there was earlier on. 3D, 4D really used as, as necessary. MO techniques are mandatory for arrhythmia, but stipulated for function in the AIUM guidelines most recently. And for functional assessment, then this really is looking at um, M mode and Doppler, some recommendations don't make any statement on uh, functional assessment at all. And the most recent ones really looking at fractional shortening and uh, uh, other types of techniques, including strain where necessary. Biometry, uh, again, varies according to the different, uh, in terms of the different recommendations. So the more recent recommendations tend to be uh, uh, recommending uh, quant a quantitative measurement approach to the chambers, outflow tracts, and some of the recommendations, including things of the measurements of the fetus, such as the BPD and femoral length. Now, I'm going to switch now to measurements because if measurement is creeping into some of the recommendations, then it's important to understand how we're doing it. And clearly, we can't use a uniform range because the size of the fetal heart changes so dramatically with gestation. So the sort of uh, approach we have to take is not a one size fits all, but you really have to create either gestation specific or si fetal size specific reference ranges through gestational age. And the way this is most commonly done is with the use of Z scores, which represents how many standard deviations above or below a population mean that a measurement lies. So anything above zero indicates a measurement which is above the mean, and the z-score below zero is a measurement below the mean. So here we're just showing an example of measuring the distal transverse aortic arch. It's really important to when you are using the z-scores that you don't view them all as the same. There are, these are some of the publications from Schneider, Lee, Pasquini, and most recently from our own unit, uh, uh, Atricia Vigneswaran's data published in 2018, where the approach to measurement 
the timing of measurement and exactly what is being measured vary slightly. So, for example, if you look at the the arteries here in the Lee publications, these are measured with the valve open, whereas in our standards, we tend to measure with the valve closed because we prefer to be able to see the valve in the closed position to make the measurement of the vessel. So it's quite important that you understand which sort of data you're using. And it's really not enough, although the guidelines may stipulate measurement. In practice, you're going to have to go a little bit further if you're using those, understand what those measurements mean and use them consistently within your own unit. Why are we bothering with measurements? Well, for a number of things, for example, uh, aortic stenosis, pulmonary valve stenosis, even pulmonary atresia, and probably most prominently coarctation of the aorta, it's the prediction of the, an outcome is in some way based on measurement. So here we have an example where you can see ventricular asymmetry here and the hypoplastic aortic arch. And here from the same paper, you can see that the chance of confirming coarctation of the aorta postnatally actually varies with the distal transverse aortic diameter and with the arterial duct diameter Z scores. So these are being used to predict an outcome um, rather than just for the sake of it. But be very careful. This is a nice paper from Cantonotti in 2018. And if we look just, for example, at the uh, uh, Z scores where we take, say, an isthmus diameter here of, uh, say, the, the uh, is in the order measures 3.5 millimeters. Depending on whether you use a gestational age or femoral length based Z score, Z score may change. And you may not, if you take the same data into different reference sources, you won't necessarily get the same uh, Z score. So if you're going to use a set of Z scores, you probably need to be consistent and stick with that for your for your own unit. If we're looking now at assessment of cardiac function, because some of the guidelines are now talking about measurement of cardiac function, including MO, Doppler indices, tissue Doppler, and other derived indices, most commonly things like the myocardial performance index or cardiovascular profile score. First of all, I would draw your attention to, for example, standard pulse Doppler, the recent publications from our own unit, uh, which is published in JACE, which includes normal data for inflow and outflow tracts from over 7,000 fetuses. And if you look at some of the derived index, one might, one might think that this would be something which would be fairly consistent and repeatable. But this is a nice uh, meta-analysis of looking at publications of Meyer Park cardio performance index from different groups across gestational age and you can see that there really is not very much agreement as to what is normal or not normal across gestational age and this impacts the generalizability of these type of measurements one of the big uh, uh, buzz areas at the moment is to look at myocardial deformation and what is important to understand here is that the heart both shortens as it contracts and also as you'll see from the image on the right it also twists or uh, the both the apex and base, base of the heart rotate during the cardiac cycle now it's now possible to track this through the cardiac cycle to look and this is just showing these dots hanging on to different segments of the myocardium so these are tracked through the cardiac cycle and this has the potential to provide a measurement of function which is based on standard grayscale images, is highly automated taking out observer variation and potentially angle independent, so it's not so dependent on the lie of the fetus. And it's, this, we know from both prenatal and postnatal work, this is a very sensitive measure of subclinical myocardial dysfunction. We know that for most disease states, longitudinal deformation falls before radial, and we are able to look at original grayscale images with rapid post-processing, and they held the prospect of being angle independent, which of course for the fetus would be uh, would be great. The, some of the flies in the ointment here are that if you look at the uh, vendor dependency, 
Here you can see a bland Altman plot looking at, for example, a uh, general electric system compared to Philips, and you can see there is a bias towards one vendor to produce different measurements from another. And this is in fact, um, looks to be a real problem. And so the technique depends to be dependent on, to be vendor specific. And this again, makes it difficult to compare between either studies or between different groups or different machines. This is a, a paper we undertook to look at this in more detail. Now this is you based on the Canon system to look at myocardial deformation. And we looked at the uh, left ventricle and we looked at fetuses where the fetuses are in an up down position, in an oblique position and in a perpendicular position here. But I'd like you to look here to say that where we picked relatively low frame rates, longitudinal strain is shown here. There is a difference between whether the same fetus is scanned, scanned with the apex up down, whether the apex is oblique or whether the apex is perpendicular. So the so-called septal view. And the same is true if you compare the low frame rate results with the high frame rate results. So even within an ultrasound system, it looks to be that this is not as is not completely angle uh, independent and does depend on ta technical fa factors such as the frame rates. So I think when if it comes to applying this in terms of guidelines, I think professional bodies making guidelines will want to know that the guidance is generalizable. Um, and this means that generic statements will be made about use of functional techniques, but really the normal reference ranges for users will be quite challenging because of, as I mentioned, the technical factors due to frame rates and fetal lie, and also to which vendor system is being used. Now, a further uh, issue with many of the guidelines we have at the moment is that the vast majority of guidelines relate to the mid trimester. Now we fully accept that that's when most fetal cardiac diagnoses are made, but a lot of the action is much earlier. Many, many of you will be looking at fetuses at the time of nuchal translucency, not just at the nuchal translucency, but also trying to obtain some other uh, views of the morphology, into, including the heart. There may be high risk family, family groups. So for example, previous hypoplastic left heart, where families will want to be seen earlier rather than later. And even with the results of NIPT, which is increasing clinical practice, and this is translating into a high demand for cardiac assessment at a much earlier stage of pregnancy. So there is some guidance out there. If you look at some of the, uh, uh, these are not uh, societal guidance statements, but really quite helpful references in terms of the sort of things which can be seen at different gestational ages. And you see at a minimum in terms of some of the, the uh, available publications are focusing on seeing two inflows and four chamber views, greatly assisted with the use of color flow and uh, uh, abbreviated views of the outflow tract, particularly three vessel and three vessel trachea views. And a similar approach being adopted in later uh, publications. So I'd refer you to those to look at those in some detail, uh, but again, without societal recommendations at the present time. And this really matches with our experience where we're actually saying, look, we can now get pretty good images early in gestation, and here again, we're seeing the live images where we're actually looking at outflow tracts as well as the four chamber views. So the sort of views we can get now at 13 to 14 weeks are really far increasingly, they're just better and better. And in some situations, this is a 13 week gestation fetus. We're actually making firm diagnosis where we can see the typical appearances of hypoplastic left heart, only a single inflow, severe hypoplastic left ventricle, reverse flow in the transverse aortic arch to make a confident diagnosis of hypoplastic left heart, even at this stage. Some of the challenges are going to be about the more subtle diagnosis. Very easy to pass this as normal, but as you see the sweep, you'll see from the left ventricle, the pulmonary artery bifurcating and then subsequently aorta from the right ventricle. So an early diagnosis of simple transposition of the great arteries. And so the challenges really are about how confidently we can confirm normality, the confidence of detection of abnormalities, and exactly what our policy is for sequential re review, even if the early scan is normal.
And we're being greatly assisted if we look at some of the new techniques which were simply not available earlier uh, in, in earlier times. So here we're seeing really beautiful early gestation pictures of the pulmonary veins and beautifully detailed pictures of the aortic arch using a technique which is proprietary to Canon, which is the superb microvascular imaging. And this actually allows us to see many structures which are very hard to imaging and is sensitively encoding uh, the, the movement of blood and something we certainly use in addition to standard tech. So if we look at this, for example, here, this is an early gestation double aortic arch. You can see right aortic arch, ductal arch and smaller uh, left sided aortic arch. And I'd refer you to the paper from ourselves about this in more detail. Disease progression is, is clearly extremely important. And what we're seeing here is this is a fetus at 16 weeks where this looks perfectly normal. And this is the appearance at 30 weeks. And this is where there is a family history of cardiomyopathy. So you cannot rely on the normal appearances early to think that the appearances will be normal later on. So be careful with early gestation. And now we're entering a phase where in fact, we're looking at where the operator is not completely in charge of the scan. Uh, so let's take an example here where we're looking at this scan picture. And this is from our own group where you can see that this is an automated detection of different cardiac views. So the system has learned how to detect different views of the heart through machine learning. And so this is going to really, I think, transform the approach we'll be taking in the coming years to the prenatal diagnosis of congenital heart disease. And this is an example where this system is now extracting, not only looking at core images for the whole scan, but actually with automated biometry, including all parts of the fetus, now we're moving onto the heart, with the system picking out these images to store and com compiling a more automated type of report. And this may look uh, uh, great, and is not just being extended to um, normal or abnormal, but also being extended to specific abnormalities. So for example, here it's distinguishing between normal, and the segmented model, and hyperplastic left heart, which is shown here. And this is again, there's published data from UCSF on exactly a very similar type of approach to detect particular congenital heart lesions rather than simply normal versus abnormal. But where does this learn? Well, what are the rules with this? We've got, a, we've got the, all of the technology behind this. We've got some sort of post-processing and actually then you are using the system. So if we miss something or make a mistake, you, who is at fault? Is it, is it the software? Is it the translation of that software into the system? Is it still the user? And what are the rules and guidelines in that situ situation? I think this is going to be something for the future. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to acknowledge all members of our team at the Evelina London, particularly the team members I've listed here, Rita Zedrait, David Lloyd, and Tom Day have all helped me with this presentation. Those are contact details for any questions. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you.